All right, we're back. We're with Perry Ann Boring from the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Perry Ann, how are we doing today? What's up, Brad? Doing good. I'm doing great. Look, we have a lot to talk about, and I want to pack it in as tight as we can for the audience because it's all fantastic. Let's start with SAB 121. Tell us quickly really what that is and how it's so important because you guys have been really working very hard to get this attention to this so we can get it turned around and it's going to be great for crypto when you do yeah so we're getting deep in the trenches of the regulatory conversations uh, in washington for crypto this is the sec's the security and exchange commission's staff accounting bulletin 121 uh, more importantly you can just kind of colloquially call this the, the the crypto custody rule sec's uh uh, it, rules and requirements on custody for crypto. Uh, this staff accounting bulletin, what, what it would require of an institution to provide custody services is it's completely unworkable. Uh, we've met with many, many institutions, uh, including some of the you know, largest banks in the world who are interested in providing custody services for digital assets, but can't because what is in the staff accounting bulletin makes it impossible to do so. So I'll just explain what the requirement is. What it says is that the custodian would have to hold, if, it, if it's holding a digital asset on its balance sheet, it would have to hold an equal amount of something else. So we're talking 200% reserve. So if, if the, the institution has $1 million dollars, worth of XRP on its balance sheet, then they would also have to hold $100 million of cash or cash equivalent or something else deemed appropriate by the regula regulator because of how high risk crypto is, is to be considered. Uh, there is no institution that can, um, uh, can turn this into a workable business model. Model uh, and it has absolutely prevented important institutions from offering crypto custody services. Um, so the reason why I believe this is something that's so important and why it's we spent a lot of time pushing back and fighting against Op One Twenty One uh, is because in order to mainstream cryptocurrencies in the United States and across the globe and to make this technology accessible to the people of the world, we will need institutions to be a part of that. Um, today, the you know, financial infrastructure, uh, there's you know, millions if not more people that rely on the traditional financial system to operate. Even cryptocurrency businesses need a bank account to pay their taxes and to have an operated cryptocurrency business. So there absolutely is an important role for our financial institutions to play in the world of the cryptocurrency space. Um, because this would totally preclude them, um, we're pushing out a lot of opportunity for investment. Um, one of the... Uh, core stakeholders would be um, institutional investors. So if we want to see institutional investors investing in digital assets, so think of this as large head funds, um, large investment funds, pension funds, endowments, sovereign wealth funds, all of which we know are already looking at this space, some have made some investments, um, but these are regulated, you know, it, investor vehicles uh, with the highest degree of oversight, and many of, of whom have to have regulated custodians for their investments, including cryptocurrency investments. So in order to have institutional level investors in cryptocurrency, we have to have institutional grade infrastructure to support them, and custody is a critical one. So I do think the SEC knew what they were doing when they issued Staff Accounting Bulletin 121. I think they knew that it would make it impossible for some incredibly important um, providers to come into our community and offer services to our space and knew that it would hold back innovation. Um, so we've done a lot of work at the Chamber of Digital Commerce to educate our policymakers, particularly in Congress, about why this doesn't work. 
and why we need something better. Uh, so that led to the Government Accountability Office doing a study on this, and they issued uh, a ruling uh, late last year that said the way that the SEC issued Staff Ac Accounting Bulletin 121 violated the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, this is kind of interesting because as, uh, you know, this happens kind of often in D.C., and that's why it's so important to push back. But we have a regulator who's you know trying to put regulations on the industry, but they're not following the own regulations that apply to them in doing so. And that's exactly what's happened uh, with Sub 121. Uh, so Congress has introduced a joint resolution to fully nullify uh, Sub 121 that was just announced a couple of days ago, uh, and uh, and now Congress needs to pass it. Uh, and we're working to secure the votes uh, to make that happen. This is really remarkable because what you're talking about, it, you know, it felt like it was one more little thing that they could do to try to slow down the institutions, head funds and people like that to participate in offering these services to their clients. Because, you know, it, it put them in a position where if somebody had a million dollars worth of Bitcoin, then they have a, have a million dollars in cash or T-bills or whatever it is to offset that because they were required to handle a customer's assets on their own balance sheet like a liability that's insane to me i mean that's absolutely insane and i don't think that's ever been done before has it no there, there's no uh custody business today that operates yes. that way you, yeah. you couldn't you couldn't build a successful uh business it would be a non-profit business which is what i did but <laughs> well you know what let me ask this perry Ann, because well thank goodness that you did too because it's 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 uh, organizations like yourself at the Chamber of Commerce, you know, uh, that you're doing this kind of work because this is the little stuff, honestly, that keeps the, it keeps us all from being able to move forward. And a lot of us have busy lives. We can't keep up with all of this stuff. You can't know every single thing that's happening every day. I follow the market every day and I don't know what the hell is going on all the time, right? It's just impossible. So, Listen, we do appreciate the work that's done at the Digital Chamber of Commerce. That all the stuff that you guys are doing is amazing. And I'm going to real quick, I want to touch this because it's so important. I've been telling people, and I mean this, to get a ticket to XRP Las Vegas and the benefit dinner that you're doing with the Future of Digital Assets Benefit Dinner that is going to have Brad Garlinghouse, Michael Arrington, Chris Giancarlo, and uh, John Deaton, and Eleanor Terrett, and there may even be another guest or two we don't even talk about right now. But what I'll say is, is that it's important for people to get these tickets and come to these events because it's, it's not a cost, it's an investment. You're making an investment to get yourself around the right people where the rubber meets the road to know where this space is going and to affect that by bringing your voice into the conversation and have a chance to sit down and have dinner with you or Brad Garlinghouse or someone else, right? And these things, you know, we are social creatures as people and you can't, people, you know, they, they think you're connected because you're on a social media app or what have you. But the reality is, is that being in person working together, sharing your viewpoints, having someone like you take those viewpoints and go back to Capitol Hill and do what you're doing. That's what we need, right? This is the moment we're in. So I hope people understand the importance of making the investment and participating in that dinner and that conference this year. Now, I know we got other stuff to touch on real quick because Janet Yellen was just out here. Now, I don't get me going on Janet, but all I'm going to say is, is Janet was talking about crypto, Barry Ann, and she's talking about spot markets, stable coins. Tell us what you're seeing here. Yeah, it, a very interesting hearing uh, happening in Congress with Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. So she she's made some remarks specific to cryptocurrency. Uh, and it's important to understand that her comments are not in agreement with Chairman, uh, the SEC Chairman Gary Gensler's comments, uh, very, very unique to see a split. Uh, you know, mind you, uh, Chairman Gensler uh, was appointed by this administration. He's part of 
you know, the, the, the Biden administration serving at the SEC chair. So to have two different people <laughs> within the administration to, you know, not agree, it's extremely, extremely rare that this happens. And it just shows you just how out of line uh, Chairman Gensler has been with his anti-crypto uh, agenda. So specifically, some of the things that she's talking about is that uh, Congress needs to act uh, to uh, you know, put specific laws in place. Uh, she talked about stable coins. We've been talking about a stable coin bill for years. You know, I think there's a lot of alignment there. Um, the the bigger alignment question has been with regulation that addresses the regulatory clarity for digital assets. So the big issue has been where is the SEC's jurisdiction? Where does it start? Where does it end? And where is the SEC's jurisdiction? Where does it start? Where does it end? And then, you know, other agencies that may have jurisdiction. But the line between is it a security or a commodity is the one that there's been, you know, biggest confusion on, as you know. Um, so Chairman Gensler has said, look, everything, you know, all tokens, that he thinks they're all securities. J Janet Yellen, in her testimony, just said, uh, there, there are not that there, there are cryptocurrencies that are not securities, uh, and was calling for spot market that the CFTC to have spot market oversight um, of uh, crypto commodities uh, like like Bitcoin. Um, so it's uh, this is all kind of unfolding in real time, uh, but extremely important to have Treasury. Uh, calling on Congress to pass these uh, laws uh, because that's really what we need to give the industry clarity to be able to operate a digital asset business in the United States. Um, so overall, this, this is a very important um, testimony that, that's been provided by Secretary Yellen, and hopefully Congress will get its act together and act soon. <laughs> well, from your lips to God's ears, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, we definitely want to see that happen. Um, you know, well, one of the things that's really interesting that stuck out to me uh, with Janet Yellen's comments is when she talked about the spot market. And we know that we've heard Rostin Benham talk about the fact that the CFTC needs just a little bit of clarity from Congress to be able to control and over, you know, oversee and regulate crypto in that spot market. Isn't that correct? So spot market oversight is something that I think is an incredibly important conversation that the whole community really needs to understand what that, you know, exactly what that means. Today, the CFTC does not have oversight over the spot market, it exclusively has authority over futures and derivatives markets. So once you're trading on margin, uh, then, you know, then, the, then any type of product would have to be registered and is directly regulated by the CFTC. Commodities, the you know, commodity spot markets are not uh, regulated from a, a surveillance perspective. If there's uh, manipulation or fraud, the, the CFTC can step in. Um, but the way that they're regulating the spot markets, uh, and if they see some you know manipulation or fraud, you, usually they come in after the fact. So it's it's not more of a a surveillance uh, regulatory system that's in place. That is what uh, Chair Benham has called for is spot market authority, which means of crypto commodities, which means that the CFTC would essentially be surveying, sur sur uh, surveying the um, you know real time market activity. That's a big shift. That is a very big shift. Uh, and some of the, the legislative proposals in Congress, you know, that, that is exactly um, what they do. They give, they give the CFTC spot market authority over crypto commodities. As a limited government person, I, I think we, we want to think very carefully about expanding any <laughs> government agency's uh, reach. But the one thing I think everybody agrees on is that um, we the, the industry would prefer to be in the CFTC's jurisdiction versus the SEC's jurisdiction, and that cryptocurrencies, many of which look more like a commodity than a security, that's a more appropriate regulatory regime to be in. But we need to you know walk into this with eyes wide open that it's not a typical CFTC authority that we're talking about. We're talking about spot market oversight, and that's that that's different. 
So in that regard, if you could wave a magic wand, what it, what what happens if you could decide where it all goes? Is it a separate organization to participate into this? What do you see? A new division? What do you got? Yeah, so I like the term intentional digital asset securities and you know, some of the lawyers in the space are using that word. So for digital assets that have been issued intentionally to be a security, sure. obviously you know, they should have a path to be registered and regulated by the SEC. And the SEC has really dragged its foot on that. For commodities, you know, they they sh they should be under the CFTC's jurisdiction. You know, spot market authority, you know, again, I think it's important to fully understand what that means. You know, if there was, uh, you know, I think the piece of the conversation that's missing is a self-regulatory organization, you know, uh -huh. all financial markets. Um, there are SROs that operate within regulated financial markets. So I think the piece that is really missing from the conversation is we need to clearly define the jurisdiction of these agencies. And then, you know, I think the first thing the CFTC should do is stand up um, or designate a, a self-regulatory organization to oversee um, this activity in the, the crypto commodity markets. And I think that would be an ideal uh, step forward. I wouldn't advocate for a whole new um, regulatory agency. I, you know, again, I don't think we want to expand the size of the government, but I do think there's an important role um, for an SRO. And that is currently missing from the conversation, but I think that should be the, ne the next piece of it. Now, is, it, is KYC AML, that's a self-regulating uh, kind of, organizational thing that's been put in the financial system, I believe, isn't it? Isn't that something they all decided to do? That's all regulated by Treasury. So, okay, so it's regulated by Treasury. Then. Right. So there's many different agencies that play different roles. So Treasury is overseeing the Bank Secrecy Act. So that's all your AML, KYC, rules okay. and regulations. And then OFAC is also under Treasury. So that's uh, sanctions. So yeah. all companies, you know, have to, uh, you know, abide by uh, the sanctions laws and AML rules and regulations, regardless of kind of where you sit. And FinCEN actually was the first regulatory agency in the world to issue regulations specific to digital assets. And FinCEN was really one of the agencies that's actually done a relatively good job of being proactive and just making it clear this is where our, our our rules apply and where they don't. So you don't have the same issue we've had with the SEC where they just they won't tell you what the law is. And then you know, God forbid you, you know, you mess up and you get into an enforcement activity. Fenton's been very, very clear where their laws apply, regardless if we agree on the laws or not. Um, that's a whole nother philosophical debate you know, many people would love to have, uh, but they have been clear. So the, the, the AML frameworks are a little bit different, um, but those fit into our national security goals. So, you know, it is a little bit telling that when it comes to national security, we're not playing around. You know, the government's been pretty clear what applies, what doesn't. But then when it comes to this other stuff, it's gotten extremely political and that's been very detrimental to the industry overall. Well, it has been. And there's a lot of geopolitical events that are taking place that really kind of push these issues to the back burner on the Capitol Hill. And that's really discouraging, too, because I feel like, you know, I feel like some of those geopolitical events could affect the actual dollar itself. And if things go horribly wrong there, you're going to need stablecoin legislation to deal with any adverse effects or spillover shocks that could be spilled over to the U.S. dollar. Right. So it's I think stablecoin legislation is super, super important, not only because it's the on and off ramps to crypto, but because it can actually act as a sponge or spillover shocks to any hyperinflation that we may, we may experience that's more than the inflation we're already experiencing here in the country. And aside from that, it also, if we have legislation for stablecoins, we're talking about banks for the first time in their history of inception being 24-7, 365. And that's a massive, massive change to the financial system when you have stable coins, which are really like internet money, right? Like that's the money being used on the internet just to exchange back and forth. So very, very cool things happening. And what do you think, if you had to put a percentage on it, you know, there's been talk on Capitol Hill about a 
stable coin legislation getting through in the first quarter. Is that a 40%, 30%, 90%? What are your thoughts? I think it's a coin toss. Um, as you mentioned, there's a lot of other priorities that is taking Congress's attention. I know, you know my day is fully consumed with, with the crypto ecosystem. I'm 100% dedicated to our community. Um, but Congress has you know a number of other things going on. The border crisis is also uh, an election year where you know everybody is campaigning, and you know within the next couple of months, everyone's going to be back home in their districts running again for re-election for office. Um, plus, you know we have multiple wars going on. We've got a kind of a funding situation. Uh, that is always, you know, a crisis. When I worked on the Hill 15 years ago, you know, government funding, it was constant crisis. So there's there's other priorities. So, I, you know, I do think a lot of the political alignment has been put in place. Janet Yellen's testimony solidified, you know, a, a big piece of that. So the White House is behind it and House and the Senate are behind it. You have everything you need. Um, so it seems like from a political perspective, a lot of the things are, in the, are, are set up correctly, but is there going to be the right timing to get this through the legislative calendar? Um, plus, we still are facing headwinds from the anti-crypto army of you know tech, uh, uh, Gensler and Elizabeth Warren. So there are people on the other side of this um, that you know that will do everything at all costs to stop this from happening. But that, yeah, it, it's it's still a coin toss today. I think it's it's a 50-50 shot. Yeah, it is. And I almost wonder if it does get through that they may have to attach it to a larger bill to get it through. Is, any thoughts on that? If there's what? If they're going to get stablecoin legislation through, they may need to attach it to a larger bill to get it through. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that Or it'll be a part of a package. So, yeah. I mean, that's typically how things get done. It, it gets tagged on to something else or things all get passed as as a package deal. And, you know, there's always these deals behind, between the House and the Senate where the Senate will say, okay, we'll, we'll pull these bills forward and bring them to the floor if you bring those bills forward. Um, so there's a lot of this kind of interesting deal-making that, that happens behind, you know, in, in, in the background as well. Horse trading at its finest. Perry Ann Boring, any final comments before we wrap this up? Oh, yeah. The one other thing I just wanted to point out that I thought was just, just great. Um, in, in Secretary Yellen's uh, testimony, she had, you know, she talked a little bit about the importance of enforcing our laws. Uh, and I think what she was really alluding to is, is the Binance settlement or the Binance, uh, you know, piece that was, you know, big news a couple months ago. Um, I couldn't agree more that we should be vigorously enforcing the laws against bad actors. And we should start with the biggest fraudster in crypto history, which is Sam Bankman Free. Let's not forget that this administration is not pursuing a second trial on SBF against some of the most egregious violations of law, most of which had to do with political corruption. Yeah. The, the Department of Justice is not pursuing those charges. Why? Mm -hmm. Why? At the end of the day, our political system, if it is subjected to corruption, we lose everything as a democracy and we should be protecting that at all costs. Um, so I think it's a huge mistake uh, you know, to, to not pursue those charges. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's something that, you know, it, it was, I think, omitted from Secretary Yellen's comments. And if we want to vigorously enforce the laws, which we 100% should, it has to apply to everybody, no matter who their parents are or where they went to school. Oh, that's so well said. It, it, good for the goose, good for the gander. And, you know, uh, it's such a simple question, but a great question. Why? Why is Sam Bankman Freed allowed, or Sam Bankman Fraud, however you like to say it, uh, mm -hmm. Why is he allowed to get away with these things that you and I would be in jail for immediately and there'd be no discussion? There would be none of this not pursuing charges. And I think if you dig deep enough, I know a lot of us understand that, you know, he met with Gary Gensler. He got this approval for a license that was coveted that nobody else could get. He was also the second largest Democratic donor at the time. Are all these things connected? You know? 
It should it should be pursued. It should be pursued. No question about it. Perry Ann Boring, thank you so much for all you do. Shout out to everybody at the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Make sure you get your tickets for the Benefit Dinner and XRP Las Vegas. It is going to be an investment. You will not be sorry that you made for yourself and your family. We will catch you on the next one. Thanks, Bradley. See you in Vegas.